Hello, today's video is going to be the coming of World War II from Peace to Pearl Harbor. So we are going to cover a lot of different ground and you'll see at the end the reasons why Japan attacked the United States. So first, to refresh, the United States had opened up Japan in 1853 when Commodore Matthew Perry sailed into Tokyo Harbor and demanded that Japan begin to trade with the United States. This had been after 200 years of isolation, and we also forced them to sign treaties. And after that, Japan began to modernize and adopt military, sorry, Western ways, including military attire, trying to distinguish themselves from other Asians who we might have tried to, to conquer as far as imperialism, as far as the Western nations. Why did they want to imperialize themselves? Well, first of all, there is a lack of fertile land for agriculture because Japan has of, it is made up of several islands and very small amount of land for their population. They wanted markets for finished products that they made. There was a need for raw materials for industry and they had an explosive population growth still to this day. It is one of the most densely populated areas in the world. And this was in response to Western imperialism as well. So a couple of things that had happened prior to that was the Sino-Japanese War, which is China and Japan. And that had been in the late 1800s where they gained Ty the island of Formosa, which today is known as Taiwan, as well as certain other areas, including a sphere of influence in Korea. Then they fought in 1904 to 1905, the Russo-Japanese War, and destroyed the Russian fleet. They became a world power. There was the tri Treaty of Portsmouth that was negotiated by Teddy Roosevelt, where Jan Japan was given uh, part of a, a sackful in the island, which was part of Korea, as well as a sphere of influence. They annexed Korea in 1910, and then in World War I, they joined the Allies and ended up receiving Germany's areas in the um, over Asian islands and leases in the Shantung Peninsula. All of this is re repeat mostly of what we covered in imperialism, and it's just to set up for you what is going to happen. So in the 1920s and 1930s, U.S. foreign policy is based on a retreat from internationalism and a traditional isolationism. We are not isolating ourselves from them economically. However, we are going to isolate ourselves kind of more politically. Second, there is a rejection of the League of Nations, which we covered in a previous video. There is a desire to continue to be economically engaged, as I previously mentioned, and a goal was disarmament. And so we have the Washington Naval Conference in 1921, which was uh, attended by Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, and the United States and they created the Five Power Naval Limitation Treaty. And this is where each country had a respective fleet of ships that was based on a predetermined ratio, which I have on the next slide and I'm gonna come back to. There was no improvement or development of bases in the Pacific region allowed. They were limited to only a Navy, and but it didn't specifically talk about land or air forces. And it was binding only to battleships and didn't cover smaller ships or submarines. So there are some limitations. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. The other thing was the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928, which was signed by more than 75 nations where they agreed not to resort to war to achieve their political or economic ambitions. The problem was there was no statement on, what do you do in case someone violates you, comes after you, and it allowed you to go to war if it was self-defense or an undeclared war. Here's the 553 ratio. And so basically the United States and Britain got five warships for every three that Japan got and every 1.67 that France and Italy got. Well, this is gonna be a blow to Japan who is trying to be up there equal with Britain and the United States. And by the fact that they're only getting three for every five, that seems like a blow. Never mind the fact that France and Italy get even less than Japan does, but it's still something that's going to upset the Japanese. We are helping Germany in 1924. This is something that's really interesting is the fact that Germany owed reparations to Britain and France, but and Britain and France owed money to us. So we're going to loan Germany money, to, which they're gonna to use to end this overinflation that they had, pay off some of their reparations. And that means that there is a reduction in the amount of reparations and they can begin to pay this. And then when they pay the reparations to Britain and France, we are able to recoup our money that they owe to us. Um, one individual just of note who was part of isolationism was Jeanette Rankin, who is the only person to vote no in Congress for both world wars. She was a pacifist and that is the reason for that. And she is also the first woman to serve in Congress. But as I previously mentioned, isolationists don't wanna cut themselves off completely. 
they just don't want any kind of involvement with Europe. They don't want to get sucked into anybody else's wars. Why are people isolationists? Well, first of all, public didn't really know much about wars in Europe or Asia and really could have cared less at the time. They were irrationally opposed to paying for a strong national defense to deter any attack. They were pretty much isolationists until Pearl Harbor, and all of a sudden it was kind of like they were shocked into supporting the war. And there's a lot of racism and anti-Semitism at home that leads to indifference at best. Racism when you're looking at what's going on with Japan and, and Asia, and anti-Semitism with what's going on with Germany and the Jews. Now, when you're going to have several of these slides where I'm going to have the date, the event, and America's response on this. So the first event is 1931, where Japan invades Manchuria. And I have information on that on the next slide. And basically, all we're going to do in response is criticize them and say, bad Japan, you shouldn't have done that. Really nothing stronger than that. So this is what the incident was in 1931, where a renegade group within the army planned to blow up a rail line and basically say it was the Chinese that did it. And they wanted to use it as an excuse to create and uh, to occupy Manchuria. And so they're going to do that. And they're going to set up a pup <coughs> puppet government in Manchuria, which is part of China. The military leaders are going to um, basically say, oh, well, this is defensive measure. And once the Japanese government realizes that it's too late. Uh, they would have lost face, so they just go along with it. And this is a really bad decision on their part, and it's something that's going to set up the war with the United States. Their, again, the pretense was that the Chinese bandits were trying to destroy this. Well, China is going to ask the League of Nations for help, and they're going to have a sort of investigation and recommend that Japan withdraw from Manchuria, but instead Japan's going to say, no thanks, and withdraw from the League of Nations. So nothing's really happening. And remember, all they do is get a little slap on the wrist, like, you know, bad China, you should, or by, bad Japan, you should not have done that. Now, in starting in August of 1935, President Roosevelt will sign what is going to be a series of neutrality acts that are, occur each year. And these are basically attempts to stop the United States from becoming involved in any kind of foreign affairs, because Congress really doesn't want us to get involved in a war. They want us to focus at home. Because remember, we're still in the midst of the Great Depression. So we have three acts, 1935, 36, and 37. All of these are going to outlaw any arms sales or weapons sales or loans to nations that are at war. And they're even going to say this is going to ban the sale of loans or weapons to any nation even engaged in a civil war. That is specifically Spain that is having that. We're also going to say that no American can legally sail on a ship of a belligerent nation. A belligerent nation is one that is at war. So basically trying to keep United States from getting involved in any shape or form. So this is 100% pure isolationism. And we're going to see by the end of this PowerPoint how we get to all age short of war until then once we're attacked on Pearl Harbor. So here is a cartoon, Dr. Seuss, you're going to see several of them today, kind of mocking this whole idea of neutrality of who does it help? It doesn't help anybody. The next event is in July of 1937, where Japan will invade China. And our response will be to boycott Japanese goods, although we're still going to continue to sell them scrap metal and all kinds of different things. So they ignored international treaties. And there's an incident in 1937, as I mentioned, that's called the Marco Polo Bridge Incident, which starts out as a minor dispute between Chinese and Japanese troops, but neither side wanted to back down. And so it starts the second Sino-Japanese War. And so you can really consider this to be the start of World War II in Asia. And most people think World War II starts in 1939 when the Allies declare war after Poland is invaded. But honestly, with when it comes to Japan, it really starts here in 1937. And Japan was not prepared for this war. And so this war is going to kind of go for over two years. And our reaction is to boycott Japanese goods, as I said. But we're still going to continue to sell things like cotton oil and scrap metal. So the boycott isn't a full boycott. Next, we have, we're going to move back over to Europe. In September of 1939, Germany invades Poland. And this is when we're going to have a new neutrality act in 1939 called Cash and Carry. What Cash and Carry did was allow the United States to sell weapons to nations at war only if they paid cash and transported the weapons on their own ships. So here's not one, but two problems. One is most nations don't just have cash sitting around, and especially nations at war. It's extremely expensive to have a war. And this is really 
help designed to help Britain and they can't really afford spare cash. But also if they have to spare their own ships to come over and get it, that's again, taking away from their war effort. So it really doesn't do much. It's nice on paper, but the reality is it's not helpful. And it, it is though a step away from isolationism. Then in summer of 1940, Germany defeats France and it begins to attack Britain. So our response is to spend $37 billion to rebuild our armed forces, to begin to draft 2 million troops, to ha we'll have lend lease and destroyers for bases deal. And so we begin to have a massive amount of peacetime draft that's going to happen with individuals. And then lend lease is a big one that you definitely should know. And this is when Great Britain is beginning to run out of funds. And the next bullet point is really the key. It authorized the United States to sell, transfer, exchange, lease, or lend defense materials and shipyard facilities to any country whose defense was vital to the United States. So the Roosevelt administration argued that Britain's defense was vital to our own because if Britain fell, then we would have nobody that was our ally in all of Europe. And what if Germany came after us? So we contribute approximately $40 billion in supplies to Great Britain because France is no longer existing at this point. They're, they've fallen to the Nazis. So this is going specifically to Great Britain. But the question uh, with this is how do we get these materials to them? And we don't really want to go over there because then our ships might be attacked and we'd be sucked into the war. And so FDR declares the entire western half of the Atlantic to be the western hemisphere and therefore neutral. And so we're able to patrol it and we assist Britain with locating submarines on our half of the ocean. Then there's the destroyer for bases deal in, in spring of 1940, where Winston Churchill, who is the prime minister now, is going to ask us to transfer old American destroyers that. Britain is going to need to protect cargo ships. So we are going to send 50 destroyers in exchange for rights to build American bases in Newfoundland, Bermuda, and islands in the Caribbean like St. Lucia. This is going to lead to the founding of the America First Committee with Charles Lindbergh, which I'm going to come back to later in this video. Then in 1940, we have an election and FDR had already served two terms by this point. And so tradition had been that you don't continue on for a third term, but there was nothing in the constitution that said he couldn't. And so he ran and he ran against Wendell Wilkie who lost tremendously. And at this point, FDR looks at, at it as a mandate to expand the nation's role in the war. And here is a map that shows you 449 electoral votes to 82. So overwhelmingly a majority for Roosevelt. In December of 1940, after the election, FDR is going to begin to use this idea of an arsenal of democracy. The fact that we are going to produce the weapons, tanks, ammunition, whatever it is that Britain needs to defeat the Nazis, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna stay out of the fighting, but we're gonna provide them everything they need to fight. Then in January of 1941, the following month, he gives a speech in which he outlines his vision for a world that avoids war, where freedom of speech, of religion, from fear and from want is the reality for all nations and all peoples. And these are four famous posters created by artist Norman Rockwell that explain it. And on the next slide, I have some excerpts from this where he says, in the future days, which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. And he realized that there are parts in the, in the world where you cannot speak freely. Take today in 2021, for example, where in the United States, you have the right to criticize your elected leaders. But if you look at North Korea, if you were to criticize Kim Jong-un, who knows what would happen to you? You might not be here tomorrow. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. Again, something that in the United States, freedom of religion is something that is sacred and is put into our constitution. But there are places in the world where those in a minority have to hide their religion. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings, which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. So he feels like there should not be basic questions of shelter and food, that everyone should have that. And the fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit any act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. So that one's self-explanatory. And then he says that is no vision for a distant millennium. It is a definite basis for a kind of world attainable in our own time and generation. 
That kind of world is very antithesis of the so-called new order of tyranny, which the dictators seek to create with the crash of a bomb. Now, in summer of 1941, Germany had previously had a non-aggression pact with the Soviets, and they were basically going to go do their own conquests and leave each other alone. Well, no surprise here, Germany decides that that no longer suits them and they invade the Soviet Union, at which point we have the Atlantic Conference and Charter. And this is where Churchill and FDR are going to meet in August of 1941 and declare a joint war aims should the United States and Britain get involved. And as you look at these, collective security, disarmament, self-determination, freedom of the seas, and economic cooperation. That should sound very familiar to you because this is pretty much the same kind of things that Woodrow Wilson had in his 14 points when he went to the Treaty of Versailles. So again, the when Britain is being bombed by Germany and most of Europe is controlled by Germany, the United States increased its assistance to Britain. And another way you could put the arsenal of democracy is all aid short of war. Between 1938 and 1940, we're kind of backtracking now because we're looking at Asia. Japan had gone on the offensive and continued against China. They had declared that their region of the world was the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. And it was kind of the Monroe Doctrine of Asia. And I spoke about that in the imperialism video. Well, at the time, the United States is going to move its Pacific fleet to from San Diego to Pearl Harbor. And you may say, well, what's the big deal with that? Well, if you look at where Pearl Harbor is, and you know San Diego is farther to the right off this map, you can kind of understand that if we're moving more and more towards Japan, that they might start to feel threatened. In addition, we have the Naval Expansion Act, which promised within three years to triple the size of the U.S. Navy. This is going to make the Japanese a little bit nervous and worried that we are angling to attack them at some point. Then in late 1940, Japan will ally with Germany and they will sign the tripartite agreement in which they become allies with Italy and Japan. And we at that, sorry, Italy and Germany. And we saw that at the time to be them siding with the wrong people. So we begin to embargo, embargo their exports, particularly scrap iron to Japan. We're going to freeze the Japanese assets and bank accounts and we're going to cut off their oil exports. Now, here is what our from 1937 to 1941, what we had given to Japan. The left column in each of these is the total amount of oil, steel, and scrap iron that Japan had imported to them. The column to the right of it is the amount of US oil, steel, and scrap iron they received. So I wanna point out that in 1937, for example, out of 482, and this is in tens of thousands of tons, we had given them 380, so a large percentage of it. But if you look at how much less they have by 1941, you can see that it's severely dropping off. And hopefully you're making that connection that you can't power ships without oil. And if Japan is going to want to continue to expand and have its empire, it desperately needs oil. Next, you're also going to look at US steel and how that dramatically drops off even more so than the oil. Steel has made it needed along with scrap iron to build ships. So Japan is feeling backed into a corner by this point. There does happen to be oil that is available in the Dutch East Indies, but we have the Philippines that we control and it's in the way. I forgot to include a map of that um, with this. And so just kind of imagine that there's this in the way. So now we get to December 7th, 1941, which is also December 8th where we're talking about and they're going to attack Pearl Harbor, but there's also attacks in Clark Field in the Philippines, Hong Kong, and other areas controlled by the British at this point. So the next day, we are going to issue a declaration of war on Japan, and we will talk more about Pearl Harbor in the live class. Now I want to just end up really quickly with two different views of U.S. involvement, because not everybody is on board with getting involved even after Pearl Harbor. So first we have Charles Lindbergh, who is a very outspoken isolationist. He starts a group called the America First Committee, whose job they see basic mission is to keep the United States out of war. And he is going to use his fame as a pilot and as a national hero to gain this audience for his ideas. And it's interesting how people responded to him. And I want you to point out some of these words. This is an editorial that appears after he gave a speech. So it says in his radio broadcast last night, Colonel Lindbergh advised the American people to stop this hysterical chatter of calamity and invasion that has been running rife these last few days. 
Let us put to one side the question of invasion, since Colonel Lindbergh himself believes that the country needs a greater air force, a greater army, and a greater navy, which is all that the advocates of more adequate national defense have themselves been saying. Let us consider instead this hysterical chatter of calamity that also annoys him. The hysterical chatter is the talk now heard on every side that the democracies of France and Great Britain stand in imminent danger of defeat by Germany. So in this case, hysterical doesn't mean ha ha funny. It means that paranoia, like they're just in, in hysterics, just crying and, and just upset and calamity is just destruction. Colonel Lindbergh is a peculiar young man. If he can contemplate the possibility in any other light than as a calamity for the American people, he is an ignorant young man if he trusts his own premise that it makes no difference to us whether we are deprived of the historic defense of British sea power in the Atlantic Ocean. He's a blind young man if he really believes that we can live on terms of equal peace and happiness, regardless of which side wins the war in Europe. So notice this person has called him a peculiar man an ignorant young man and a blind young man. But what is so striking about this source to me is the last sentence where he just felt like he had to put in there, Colonel Lindbergh remains a great flyer. It's like you just slammed this guy in this editorial, but somehow you need to undo it by acknowledging that he is a great flyer. Can you imagine today those the different news media that are slamming political leaders and at the, at the end they say, oh, by the way, they're a great whatever. It's just not something that I think would happen today. You know, here is a flyer that talks about what America First stands for. And first of all, they say our duty is to keep America out of foreign wars. Our entry would only destroy democracy, not save it. The path to war is a false path to freedom. Not by acts of war abroad, but by preserving and extending democracy at home, can we aid democracy and freedom in other lands. In 1917, we sent our American ships into the war zone, and this led us to war. In 1941, we must keep our naval convoys and merchant vessels on this side of the Atlantic. We must build a defense for our own shores so strong that no foreign power or combination of powers can invade our country by sea, air, or land. And humanitarian aid is the duty of a strong free country at peace. With proper safeguard for the distribution of supplies, we should feed and clothe the suffering and needy people of the occupied countries. Now, standing in contrast to Colonel Lindbergh and actually making fun of him, as you will see a little bit later, is Dr. Seuss, whose real name is Theodore Geisel. He was extremely opposed to isolationism. He published tons of news of political cartoons. So you may know him for his famous children's books, but like the cat in the hat. But he also was extremely active during World War II. And here you can see this cartoon, Ho-Hum, when he's finished pecking down the last tree, he'll likely be quite tired, where this Nazi bird has peck down every other country in the world and we think we're safe. So he does a lot of this poking fun of the fact that we're, uh, we think because we're across the ocean that we're safe. And you can see here, ho-hum, no chance of contagion while Europe has Stalinich, Hitleritis, Blitzpox, Nazi fever, fascist fever, and the Italian mumps. And we're just safe over here on our own little continent in the ocean in between. And he also, the one on the right makes me think of the phrase that says all talk and no action. He did more than 400 editorial cartoons in the span of eight years. Here are ones that poke fun of Charles Lindbergh specifically. The isolationists said a whale, there is so much commotion, such fights among fish in the ocean. I'm saving my scalp, living high on an out there. Lindy, he gave me the notion. And so Lindy is Lindbergh. And then we have the Lindbergh Quarter. And you see the ostrich. And the ostrich is known for putting its head in the sand. And it says, in God we trust and how. Since when did we swap our ego for an ostrich? And then you have one on the left that says, get your ostrich bonnet here, relieves Hitler headache. Forget the troubles, terrible news you've read, put your mind at ease in an ostrich head. Like he thinks that, you know, those that are following, following along with what Charles Lindbergh is saying are just completely out of it, out of touch with reality. And they're burying their heads thinking that the war is going to go away and not going to affect us. But then the one on the right is just one that goes even farther against Lindbergh. And the way we know that it is against Lindbergh is the fact that the woman has the phrase America first on her sweater, which that is the name of his organization he created. And at the top, when it says, and the wolf chewed up the children and spit out their bones, but those were foreign children and it didn't really matter. Again, he is just absolutely against everything that Charles Lindbergh believes as far as isolationism. And he is going to continue to push through his cartoons for the United States to get involved in the war. And that is it for this video. Thank you.